recently, the channels be getting lots of comments from people saying, we are at 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. It's a legitimate concern to have because 2023 was the warmest year on record, an average of 1.45 degrees Celsius of warming compared to pre-industrial levels. And in fact, if you take the months uh, February 2023 to January 2024, that was 12 months where the average temperature was 1.5 degrees Celsius. And they worry about it because, number one, the world's governments keep telling us we're doing our best efforts to keep... Uh, temperatures below 1.5 degrees Celsius and because if you look at this chart if I can find it it shows where we think the tipping points are going to happen in some of the Earth's bigger systems for example the Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheet the northern permafrost the warm water corals are all thought to have a central tipping point estimate of 1.5 degrees Celsius and once they reach their tipping point There'd be no way of stopping them. There'd be no way of reversing that. It would have devastating impacts all around the world. So it's a legitimate concern to have. It's not just people on YouTube who are concerned about the rates of warming. Even Johan Rockström, one of the world's most respected Earth system scientists, is concerned that temperatures are warming more quickly than we'd hoped for. The planet is changing faster than we have expected. In a situation where we underestimated risks, we've reached 1.2 degrees Celsius of global mean surface temperature rise. We have just scratched on 1.5 degrees Celsius an acceleration of warming over the past 50 years. Really, we're at 1.2 degrees Celsius of warming. But the actual details behind all that is much more fascinating than the boring old headline figure. The people who decide how much global warming we've had since pre-industrial times are the World Meteorological Organization. And there's two things you need to know about them. Number one, their baseline for pre-industrial temperatures is the average temperature between 1850 and 1900. We all know the Industrial Revolution started in the 1760s in Great Britain. But there are no reliable temperatures for all around the world for that period, so that they have to go from 1850 to 1900. And even, even if they were to go back all the way to 1760, if there were reliable temperature records, then it might only add 0.1 degrees centigrade to um, the amount of warming we've had, because there was so little CO2 being emitted then, so much CO2 being emitted now, it doesn't make all that much difference. And it's not just the World Meteorological Organization that does that. The climate scientists, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they all use that same industrial baseline. Whereas when it comes to CO2 concentrations, they do go back to 1750. Because in the ice cores, there are bubbles of the atmosphere from 1750 that contain CO2. So they have a quite a good idea of CO2 levels in 1750, but not the temperatures. The other thing to know about uh, how they calculate the amount of warming we've had is they take an average of the previous 10 years temperatures around the world. Normally, the climate is said to be the average weather over a period of 30 years, but the climate is warming so quickly, if you went back 30 years, it, you just wouldn't get a sensible average. And they want to take an average because there's always natural variability. They want to get like a mean point to see how much warming we've really had. But even if you take the average for the last 10 years, you still get a lower value than what it is now, possibly. And this is one of the concerns that people have. It's, it's not exactly a conspiracy theory, but it's just a concern that maybe the way science is measuring the recent temperatures, maybe it doesn't give you up-to-date figures, maybe it's outdated already. And you can argue that, for example, I've downloaded the Hadley Crut 5 data set. It's one of the data sets that the World Meteorological Organization uses. I put it into my Google spreadsheet, which I'm now calling a climate computer. There's my average for the last 10 years, 1.2 degrees Celsius. And if you get Google to plot a trend line, then it will, it will sort of average out the ups and downs, the natural variation, but it will give you a more up-to-date value of where, where that sort of middle trend is. And it thinks we're at 1.3 degrees Celsius of warming. So you might think, well, my God, the scientists are understating the problem. They're not up to date. But if, if you carry on that trend line, if you think, if you allow for the year 2023 and nine other years and you get a really steep uh, up, up line because temperatures are increasing so quickly, you, you can see where we're heading to. It says we're going to get to 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming 
at 20.33 and 2 degrees Celsius of warming at 20.60. But if you compare that to what the actual scientists say in the um, United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessment Report number 6, Working Group number 1, it says we will get to, uh, what was it, 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming by um, 2028 and 2 degrees Celsius of warming at 2053. So even if you include the year 2023, a world record-breaking year, and just carry it on straight into the future, even though it might look serious, the proper scientists think we're going to get there at 2028. So they, it's more serious than just e even including the simple maths. Even if you think to yourself, oh my God, we're in a terrible mess, well we are, the actual scientists know we, we're in an even bigger mess than the 2023 and 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming for that one year might think you believe. What's funny is there's nothing magical about the numbers 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. In fact, neither of them were chosen by scientists. The use of 2 degrees Celsius as some sort of upper limit we should try and aim for goes back to 1975 and an economist who knew humans had only been alive in times when temperatures had been two degrees warmer than they were before industry. Three million years back, we never exceeded two degrees Celsius. That's the warmest temperature on Earth during the entire quaternary. The coldest point, minus five degrees Celsius, ice age. I call this the corridor of life. So he just intuitively thought, well, that's a good uh, target to aim for, a good maximum to try and avoid. And everyone just adopted it. United States diplomats, European government ministers, international conferences. Well, 30 years ago, two degrees Celsius wasn't too much of a concern because it was thought the tipping points, these massive changes to Earth systems that can't be stopped and can't be reversed, they were thought maybe they wouldn't happen until we get to six or eight degrees Celsius. Well, now we know, if we go back to our, our table again of tipping points, now we know, you know the Greenland ice sheet has been in danger of tipping since before one degree Celsius of warming. So two degrees Celsius is a bit outdated, but we're all sort of stuck with it. The 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, limit, or the idea we should try and keep to it, only really came in in the 2015 Paris Agreement. People realised two degrees was too high. When they said, let's go for 1.5 degrees, that wasn't a scientific decision, it was a political one. Nobody knew what a 1.5 degree world would be like, whether it was any more inhabitable than a 2 degree world. Also, the politicians didn't state the baseline. That's not the way diplomats and politicians work. They left that to the scientists to sort out all the details. So 1.5, 2 degrees Celsius. They're not scientific limits and scientific values. If you asked a scientist, they'd say, you must we already have dangerous levels of climate change. You must reverse, reverse it as quickly as possible. Don't worry about... 1.5 or 2 degrees and also the tipping points although I know I've used this this slide by Johan Rockström one of the world's most respected uh, earth system scientists so there's a big fat dot for Greenland ice sheet and the West Antarctic ice sheet at 1.5 there's a great range where they could tip so Greenland ice sheet anywhere between before 1 degree Celsius of warming and 3 degrees Celsius of warming and as it gets hotter and hotter the more likely it is to reach a tipping point and when the, uh, the World Meteorological Organization is averaging out the temperatures, you can see, well, that's a sensible thing to do. But when it comes to things like the warm water corals, just one hot, very hot year of very hot seawater, that would be devastating. Never mind the average. They won't care about the average if they all die in a single year or lots of them die in a single year. That's significant. This is the latest data on sea surface temperature across the ocean. Suddenly, in 2023, something happens. Temperatures just go completely off the chart. What's happening? We do not know. It would be nice to say that the Greenland ice sheet, because it's a massive block of ice, it would take hundreds or thousands of years to melt completely. That would be more robust. It would be more affected by the average. You know, a single year wouldn't have that much of an effect. But the trouble with tipping points is it's all about the last straw to break the camel's back. You know, the Greenland ice sheet would be getting nearer to its tipping point, nearer to its tipping point. Even a relatively low year might be enough just to melt a bit more water. So the averages don't really matter either. It doesn't change anything. We have to try and um, reduce CO2 emissions. Now, when I said, 
when I said the United Nations has predicted what, when we're going to get to 1.5 or when we get to 2 degrees Celsius, it's not definite or doesn't need to be definite that we're going to get there. As the, as the climate scientists would say, it's not committed warming. We can still turn things around. And when the United Nations looks into the future, they use what's called shared socio-economic pathways. They used to be called RCP. And that, that was the number of watts per square meter of forcing you could have, have expected. Now that now they're called shared socio-economic pathways. So at the moment, we're on shared socio-economic pathway two, which is the equivalent as representative concentration pathways, 4.5, 4 point watts square per square meter. That's where we're going to. The United Nations just today published a new report, or yesterday it was in the news, and they say, we're not cutting emissions enough. And in fact, we're heading for three degrees Celsius or 3.1 degrees Celsius in 2021 when the latest IPCC report was published it was hoped we'd be heading to 2.7 we're on the orange line here but we don't have to go that way if we were to get the whole world to be net zero by 2050 then we could be on the blue line on shared socio-economic pathway 1 dash 1.9 and then we would we would just about go over 1.5 but when we go back down remember nothing special about 1.5 anything we can do to keep it as down as far as possible gives us the most hope if we can't do that if we could be at net zero for the whole world by 2075 i know these are big ifs then we'd be on shared socio-economic pathway 1 dash 2.6 we can't do that though or at least we haven't done that yet because no country is prepared to reduce its carbon emissions quickly enough at the paris 2015 conference the governments committed themselves to keep temperature best efforts to keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees Celsius and well below 2 degrees Celsius. And each country made what's called a nationally declared contribution. And the idea was each country voluntarily contributed as much CO2 emissions, or cuts in CO2 emissions as it could. This orange line shows where we, we thought we would be going with if the NDCs, the nationally defined contributions, were, were implemented. The trouble is, not only are the NDCs not big enough to, to go where we need to go to, to avoid the tipping points and other climate impacts, but the policies that governments are implementing aren't good enough to meet their nationally determined contributions. And normally people say, yes, we're trying our best, our civilization's coming to an end, there's nothing we can do. But Johan Rockström one of the world's most respected earth system scientists thinks there is and you think well how is that we increase our amount of clean energy our solar and our wind so slowly how can we ever get there well if you're a climate scientist if you watch any count everything videos you'll know that exponential growth can go from a very small change and then it suddenly ramps up and ramps up because the the, the rate of increase is always increasing linear change is no longer an option the only option is exponential change. We know that the only currency that matters is speed and scale. And for wind and solar, that's already happening. On average, each year, the amount of solar and wind capacity being installed doubles every five years. So if we can keep that going, if we can increase the same rate, the storage and the transmission for electricity, if we reduce other uh, CO2 emissions, if we stop destroying the natural environment, there is hope there, there is a way forward. But as we shall see later on in another video, the problem isn't that it's impossible to double the rate of growth for um, solar and wind and other the other infrastructure we need. It's because there's no real political appetite. There's nothing magic about 1.5 or 2. We're already in a dangerous situation. The tipping point that are shown, 1.5, very likely or quite possible. There's nothing ma magical about those central estimates for tipping points either. There's a range. The only thing we can really say is we're in danger. I suppose you knew that already, so this video is a bit of a waste of time, but don't get too stressed about 1.5 or 2. Get stressed at just the general lack of act action from the world's governments. That's the problem. So, thank you for watching. Oh, by the way, Look what YouTube have sent me. It's a little light. The, the choice they gave me, YouTube, was either this light, and it's quite a posh light, you can turn it up and down.
Can you see that? It's a quality light. Or a sausage roll from Greg's the Baker. I can imagine that the sausage roll from Greg's the Baker was a more expensive option, but still, I'm very proud of my light. So, thank you for watching, and um, see you next time. And if we follow this path, we will crash through 2 degrees Celsius within 20 years and hit 3 degrees Celsius by the year 2100, a disastrous outcome.